All right, hello and good morning. Um, welcome back from uh, from your weekend. Um, we're oh, there we go. We're here on a Monday, or I'm here. Oh, I just realized I put the wrong. Oh goodness, there's that voice. Um, I just realized I put the wrong, uh, thumbnail. I'll have to go back and, and, uh, fix that. Good morning, Raj. Mm. You know, typing and holding a stylus is surprisingly challenging. Um, I never, never tried it before. But uh, I often do it because I'm over here at the the tablet um, writing, and then someone will say something, and I'll be like, I'll pop over to type something, and uh, <laughs> and uh, it's it's actually kind of tricky. Um, I don't know what the outside world looks like from where you're sitting, but. Uh, from 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 where I'm sitting, it's kind of uh, gray, um, but that's not not a bad thing. A um, uh, couple things, couple things to um, to touch on this morning. Um, there is uh, there is no song of the day today. Um, instead, I have a mixtape. of the day um you can go check out um what did i call this thing uh morning transmission and i made it especially for you um and me uh it's it's short 16 minutes i think what five songs um i threw together just as i was like kind of prepping for a class today and I was like I can't pick a song of the day so I'm gonna do the whole the whole thing um the the links in the description uh it's a Spotify playlist um you're welcome to check it out I realized after the fact that um as I was like setting up the 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 broadcast that um we're live streaming on 420 and in the spirit of full disclosure um the the uh this is not your typical 420 playlist it's it's actually not a 420 playlist at all except that i made it on 420 so i guess in that sense it is um but uh it's there's like no reggae or jam band stuff um maybe we'll have to do that at another point but um but it's kind of gray and cloudy so it's kind of you know a chill morning play playlist give it a give it a listen maybe you'll enjoy it um I had a, a a couple things. So so first off, I wanted to thank all of you um, f who participated in the uh, in the feedback quiz. Um, it was uh, very very helpful actually, um, and I learned a lot. I, I read every um, comment. Um, that you left, I uh, I um, tabulated and calculated weighted averages for all the ratings um, one through five on all the stuff that I asked, um, and uh, and there there were, there were several things that I that I learned um, that I didn't know. Some things that I were expecting, some things I was uh, surprised by. Um, like for example, there there were a couple of questions. So so I I um for for the things where you rated them one through five. Um, what I did is I calculated a weighted average, which interestingly enough, I taught you to do in person. Um, I think first or second week of class when we were calculating molecular weights, we learned how to take a weighted average. That's what I did for um, all your responses. So everyone who responded and 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 the 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 uh, response rate was very high. I think about ninety percent of the class um, gave me feedback, and I'm so appreciative. Um, of that and uh, 
And so, so one of the interesting things is, um, so again, out of five, um, when I asked you questions about before the transition, after the transition, um, the ratings for before, like for effectiveness and enjoyment of lecture, um, were both around four and a half. And then afterwards about three and a half. So, so it did see a drop off kind of in the effectiveness of, um, of, uh, instruction moving to purely online and, um, so, so, you know, but, but, but at least it didn't plummet. So at least this isn't totally useless. Um, but, but, but I think we all would prefer if we were in the same room, there's something that we lose, um, without that face to face or to be able to just be like, Hey Josh, what about this? And I can, you know, it's on the board. We can interact with it, all that stuff. So I think we, we all agree that, um, that in person is best, but it seems at least from your responses that the electronic manifestation that we're using doesn't completely suck, even if it's less um, than ideal. A cu uh, couple interesting um, things. Um, uh, so, so I asked whether or not you wanted like my face, you know, cause like they're, I got the idea from like my kids watch like gaming channels where they're playing a game, but then there's that little like box with the person's face up in the corner. I'm like, do you guys want that? And it was actually a 50, 50 split. Half of you said, yeah, half of you said no. Um, so I might try to bring that in at some point. Um, but it wasn't like an overwhelming, everybody wants it. So I think, um, I might casually play around with it, but we'll, we'll see. Um, what are some other things? Oh, um, an, uh, another 50, 50, there was three 50, 50 splits here. And the other, another, the second 50, 50 split was, um, live versus later about half of you like watching live, half of you like watching later. And I think one of the cool things about kind of this digital situation that we're in is, um, it caters to both. You can watch it live or not watch it live, depending upon, um, your preference. The last 50, 50 split was, was a shock for me. Um, and that was the, uh, the um uh pdf well, pp the uh pdf um lecture notes um this is something that i fell behind on kind of as i was um getting the exam out the door and then grading the exam um about half cuz cuz i i had if you're unaware of this i have been um for my for the videos for lecture and office hours um, creating, saving them as PDFs and uploading them to, um, canvas. And this was one of the things I fell behind on. And then as I was making this feedback quiz, I was wondering like, is this something people are using? Cause it, it does take work and it's work that I'm happy to do if you're using it. But, um, with canvas, I have no way of knowing, um, how much a PDF is being downloaded. So I don't know if like, I'm just throwing them up there and nobody's using them. And about half of you are actually, um, say that it's a useful tool and that you, you download them and use them. So, um, to the half of you that do use this as a resource, um, I just want you to know that, um, that I will catch up, um, that I'm not, um, abandoning it at all. Cause actually a lot more people, um, are using it than, uh, than I thought would be. So, so if you're like wondering like, Hey, where did that thing go? That was, that was my thing. I needed that. I used that. Um, that will, I will be catching up and then staying current, um, on that. Uh, another really interesting, um, kind of, uh, result from the feedback you guys gave me is I was, I was asking about, um, I asked some questions about YouTube versus zoom. Um, mostly because, um, I would say almost all of my colleagues, there's, there's one, other chemistry faculty member that I know who is doing YouTube, but everybody else in the department and then everyone, as far as I know, school-wide, I mean, I, I don't think I'm the only, um, YouTubing professor at this moment in time at FLC, but, um, vast majority of them are using zoom. And so, um, but my, 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 the reason why I went with YouTube is I've used this for kind of online extension, um, tutoring in the past. So I've, I've had some practice with using this format for, um, educational purposes. And I know that it could do a decent job, even though it's not a perfect job. And so I, I figured I would, I knew I could transition to us to this smoothly, but it was kind of in the spirit of, 
not not a spirit of full commitment. Like there may be better options. I'm in, and I, and I was very interested to know what your um, experience experience was because um because you guys are in Zoom classes and um and uh, out of so so I asked you to rate your experience on YouTube on this class um and then rate your experience in Zoom in your other courses and um and you all collectively or ninety percent of you gave. Um, your experience in this class, 4.3, um, out of five stars. Um, and you collectively said that your zoom experience was a 2.3 out of five. So a lot higher, um, uh, um, uh, customer satisfaction is the wrong word. Um, uh, you, you, you rated YouTube as a more effective, um, kind of, uh, way to do online classes over, over zoom. And I, I also asked, um, if you, if you were king of this course or queen of this course, um, and you could just pick YouTube or zoom, 85% of you said you would choose to keep it as, as YouTube. So, um, so I don't, I think we're going to, we're going to hang out with this format, um, for the rest of the semester. Again, I'm totally, I'm totally want continuous. Whoa. <laughs> uh, so what happened there, you know how when I'm like teaching, I like move my hands around. I, I do that even though I'm sitting in a room alone and uh, I just whacked my um, my pop screen for my microphone. So that was that that sound you just heard. Um, I, I, but what I was saying was I want your feedback. Please continue to um, let me know what's good, what's bad and all that stuff. But it seems like, and, and also this was echoed in the comments, um, most of you um, really prefer the YouTube format. So I believe we're going to be sticking, um, sticking with that. Um, and you guys gave me a lot of really good feedback and some of it, um, some of it, I kind of knew what the feedback would be, uh, ahead of time. So one thing that came across loud and clear from everyone was, um, was that the multiple choice was rough and, uh, and, and possibly too rough. I well, I'm saying possibly too rough. You, you guys all believe that it definitely was too rough. And I want you to know that, um, that your, um, comments and concerns are heard. One of the very common things that I read in the comments was, um, uh, most of you said that it's not that the problems were too hard to do. You, you said that you could do the problems, but that the time, um, constraint was so severe that you ended up having to guess towards the end. And, um, and, and a couple, I wanted to say a couple things on that point. First, first, I totally hear you. And, and, um, you can expect uh, with the future. So for exam three, um, that, uh, the exam three multiple choice situation, um, will not be exactly the same. Um, I'm going to obviously weigh it against the difficulty of the problems as I start writing the new exam three, uh, question bank. But, um, but, uh, I'm going to take all of your comments into consideration. Um, and, um, and we'll definitely be considering, um, a greater amount of time, uh, making a greater amount of time available. Um, yeah, totally. Um, but the other, the other thing that I wanted to say is part of the canvas multiple choice, um, uh, format is it's, it's part of it is supposed to be, can you do these fast? It's not, can you do these at all, but how quickly can you get through them? And, um, and so, so part of the frustration is by design, like that is that format where it's testing you on your speed, not on your knowledge. That being said, um, I, I do want you to know that I heard, heard all of your voices loud and clear. Um, and that I think I ratcheted the time constraint, um, uh, down maybe, maybe too hard. And that's also part of the reason why, um, I made the extra credit available, right? So, so that extra credit, um, that I made available was enough to bump your grade 10%. So literally jump everybody, um, a letter grade. I, I don't expect to need to do that on exam three because I think exam three will be more, 
um, honed, will be um, better calibrated. Uh, again, because exam, exam two is kind of our, our first experiment with that. Um, another thing that um, that came through, um, oh, sorry, um, that came through uh, in the feedback that that um, I, I found actually rather interesting is uh, um, several of you mentioned that the the length of the YouTube videos is is a little bit daunting that um that you'd actually prefer like shorter more videos that are shorter so instead of like a one and a half hour or two hour video which can be like brutal to get through and it's funny I never even thought of that but when I was reading these comments I'm like oh yeah of course that would be rough to like sit down and watch for that length of time um that it would be better in your estimation to have like like instead of one two hour video that you'd prefer like four three uh four three hour videos no four 30 minute videos like if they were broken down into smaller chunks and um i thought that feedback was really really uh interesting really um yeah just very interesting i i i um it was thought provoking and 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 thank you to the, it was it was voiced by several people and i was like huh i never thought of that because i'm I've been on the content creation end of things, but I'm, it's not like I'm watching my own um, videos um, to learn from them. And and part of the part of the conundrum because I kind of wrestled with this. I, I thought it was really interesting feedback. At this moment in time, um, our so part of the reason why the videos are so long is because we're streaming during our normal lecture time, right? Our normal lecture hours because this is a chunk of time where we know that everybody can um, can log in and view live. Now, I know half of you prefer live, half of you prefer later, but for the live crowd, I feel like I owe it to them um, to make this time available so that for those of you who prefer this, you have a chance to ask questions as I'm explaining things um, and all of that. And so, so for that reason, um, for the end of this semester, the video length won't change, but um, I wanted to make something. Um, I, but but I, I I want you to know for those of you who are like I'd like shorter videos, I definitely heard you hear you loud and clear, and um, and uh, I do want you to know. Um, this is this is part of the reason why I leave video um, timestamps. Um, in the comments. So if you go back and, and I know some of you, um, are aware of this because you, um, it actually came up for, for, uh, several of you in the feedback you gave me, you said you really liked this feature. I wanted to make sure to, um, kind of explicitly state this, um, in case some of you were unaware. Um, after I post every video, I go back and in the comment section, I create a kind of a table of contents where I'll say like, okay, we did, um, we did, uh, you know, electron configurations for, um, main groups, electron configurations for, um, uh, the D block for the F block for ions, etc. And I'll, I'll make a table of contents and then next to each subject, I'll put in parentheses the time in the video um, that that subject starts. And um, and here's the thing. You'll notice when you go look at them, you can go back and look at previous videos. You'll see those timestamps in parentheses are in blue. All right. So when you click on the... So you don't have to find where in the video that is, if you just click on it on that blue linked timestamp, it jumps you to that part in the video where that topic, um, begins. So, so I, 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 and, and the reason why I do this is because a two hour video can be huge. And maybe you want to go, I originally did this cause maybe you want to go back and you're like, where was that one problem that he did? Um, you don't have to scrub through a two hour YouTube video to find it. You can look at the table of contents, click on the timestamp and it'll, it'll get you closer to the mark. But, um, you can also use this, um, as a way of shortening the videos. Like, like, um, you can use the video timestamps to, to essentially, um, 
you know, watch the videos, you know, maybe 30 minutes at a time. And, um, and so that might create kind of the experience you want. Also, you don't need to wonder like, oh, where did I leave off? You can be like, I'm going to watch the first three bullets in this thing. Then I'm going to give myself a break, take a walk outside, clear my head, come back and do more. Um, cause it is one of the challenges. I also saw this several times in the comments that, um, that part of the challenge for you all as a student is you have to be self-motivated. You have to carve out the time and we're all just at home, you know? So it's like, you're in your pajamas, like your motivation's low, you know, you may not be getting to it. It's like, you have to create that for yourself as opposed to, I got to make it to class. So I'm not late. It, it, it forces you to get going. Whereas you have to force you to get going now. So anyways, those were some, um, very interesting comments. I wanted to kind of uh, comment on and address some of them in person. Um, again, thank you everyone. Um, for leaving comments. Oh, there, there's one, one last one. Um, um, and th this one I was kind of, um, I don't surprised is the wrong word. Um, but this, this jump, this stood out to me. Um, so for the, so there's a 50, 50 split between the live versus watch later. Um, but the rewatch crowd, um, those of you who rewatch, um, the, the lecture streams, so more than one view, um, is at 85%. Most of you are using the ability to rewatch lectures as a study tool. Um, and I, that jumped out at me, at, just cause it's overwhelming. It's, 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 it'd be a landslide victory if, if a president won by 85%, right? And, and that's the amount of you who are, um, using the fact that these videos are up on YouTube and exist to help you kind of study and, and prepare. And, and, um, I, I wanted to thank you, not from like an ego perspective, like, Oh, thank you for watching my videos. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, I, thank you for giving me that feedback because what that number tells me is that this is a, um, useful resource for you. And this is something that, um, that this whole, uh, pandemic is, uh, permanently changing in my um, teaching style, eventually the world's going to go back to normal, right? Eventually um, I'll be on campus, you'll be on campus, I'll be lecturing to a room full of students. But um, even when we do go back to that normal, um, I am going to continue to um, use this format as a way of teaching. I'm, I'm it, it, just seeing that number... Um, showed me that this is something that students that you are, are using and want. And so, um, when I go back to teaching normally, um, I'm going to be doing so by connecting my surface to a projector. Um, so that in class I'll be projecting the screen of my surface onto the, um, projector slide thing. Um, and I will be live streaming it to YouTube as I'm teaching live, um, in class because, as I saw this number and got your feedback, um, this is something that I, I think, um, that I owe to my future students to make this resource available. Um, and so, so, so I wanted to thank, thank you, um, for kind of informing me and helping, um, me evolve as a, uh, a instructor, as a professor. Um, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you, um, <laughs> Raj is YouTube office hour, um, might be the best, the best invention of all Rona season right there. All right. So anyways, um, again, thank you everyone for your feedback and leaving comments. Um, I wanted to kind of express my gratitude, um, to you and your, um, even in your criticism, it was uh, constructive and helpful. And I, I just so, so appreciate um, you all as, as a class and, and, and each of you individually. So, so thank you. Um, thank you for helping me become better um, at my job and, and hopefully 
uh, the changes that I'm going to be making based on your feedback will will give us an even better um, end end to this semester. All right. Um, also, uh, I, I guess I should uh, take just a hot second, a moment to say that um, that I did figure out what was wrong with my computer, um, and uh, and we had a smooth office hour on Friday, which I haven't time stamped yet. I will be doing that today. So if you're like, hey, wait, what, <laughs> why why isn't that last office hour time stamped? It's a gigantic video and I don't know where to go. I will be doing that today um, as well as time stamping this lecture that we're, we're running right now. And, um, and uh, yeah, but, but we did a live office hour, totally smooth on Friday and today's lecture should be good. So for those of you who are wincing as I get ready to start um, actually lecturing, uh, don't worry. Um, Kendra told us we would be all right. So, so, uh, so that's how you know it's true. Okay. So we left off. Um, like, I I get frustrated thinking about last lecture um, because of how bad it was. We had left off um, setting up. Um, I was about to start teaching how to draw Lewis structure. And um, we have these uh, six steps um, for drawing them. This is where the video ended uh, last lecture, and this is where we're going to be um, picking up. Um, so the steps for uh, drawing the Lewis structure first, we're going to uh, calculate our total number of valence electrons, select a central atom, attach the other atoms to the central, and then satisfy the octets. And I wanted to say that, um, I wanted to put a break. There's, there's six steps. You also have to calculate formal charge and draw the best resonance structure. But for now, we're just going to focus on steps one through four. All right. Five and six will come in later. Um, they're their own kind of separate discussion, but for, um, learning the ropes, we're going to start with steps one through four. Four. All right. Now, um, let's begin um, with um, drawing the Lewis structure for um, for CH four. All right. Step number one: we need to calculate our total number of valence electrons. All right, so that is step one. And when you calculate your total number of valence electrons, you look at the number of atoms in your compound. All right, so we have one carbon atom and... <laughs> I told... I totally am dabbing. And not just with the emoji, by the way. I actually did. And I might add, if I had a live video camera, you could have seen it. <laughs> but um, but you're just going to have to take my word for it as of, as of right now. Um, so, uh, so we're calculating our total number of valence electrons. This is step number one. Carbon has four valence electrons. All right. And hydrogen, when you look at the periodic table, only has one valence electron. But we have, as you can see, four hydrogens in our molecule. So all of our hydrogens together, they're each breathing one, uh, breathing one, bringing one, um, which means that our total number of valence electrons are eight. All right, we've got eight valence electrons. Um, now, step number two, we have to select our central atom. Now here in this molecule, it's carbon versus hydrogen. All right, it's carbon versus hydrogen. And when you select a... Um... <laughs> oh 
Oh my gosh. You know, that emoji could totally be a super safe Corona elbow cough. Um, which, which I have been known to do. I also cough down into my shirt. Um, just cause I, I have a cough cause it's allergy season, but it also means when I go shopping, um, people look at me with wide eyed fear because I'm in public and I'm coughing. I, I wear a mask and everything, but still, um, they, th- they look at me like I'm the specter of death when actually I'm just the harbinger of allergy season. Um, so, okay. So in, in this compound, we've got two choices. We have carbon versus hydrogen. All right. And the key thing, the key thing to remember when you're selecting your um, central atom. All right. So when you're picking out your central atom, you want the atom that can make the most bonds. As your central, all right? Whichever atom can make the most bonds, that's the one we want to pick, all right? When we look at, whoa. Oh, shoot, hang on. I just messed up my layers in Photoshop. Um, okay. I apologize, this is going to take, whenever I mess up my layers in Photoshop, it takes a weird little ring around the rosy to fix it. But I can fix it, it just is going to take a hot second. So, okay, there we go. That is back to the baby. Okay. And we're good. Okay. All right. So yes, it's going to look weird. That's not my computer messing up. That's, that's me messing up. But now, now we're back on track. We want to select the atom that can make the most bonds. All right. And when you compare carbon versus hydrogen, there's an interesting, um, helpful way of looking at who can make the most bonds. If you draw the Lewis dot structure for each, hydrogen will just have a one single dot because it has one valence electron. Carbon has four, one, two, three, four. Carbon has four unpaired electrons. Now, the octet rule, which we're going to say a little bit about this um, in a moment, but, um, or actually, I'm going to wait to say something about the octet rule. Um, Hydrogen has one unpaired electron. It, that means that normally it wants one bond. because it has one unpaired electron. So it's looking for one other unpaired electron to pair those with so it can have two electrons just like helium. Carbon, you'll notice, has four unpaired electrons. It likes to have, it wants four bonds. All right? So because carbon wants more, uh, likes to make more bonds, can make more bonds than hydrogen, we're going to select carbon as our central atom, all right? So we have totaled our valence electrons, selected our central atom. Now we need to attach our other atoms to our central atom, all right? Let's start with attaching a hydrogen. Now, to make a bond between carbon and hydrogen is going to cost something, all right? It's going to cost us two electrons because a bond, a covalent bond has two electrons in it. All right. And so we are going to have to spend two electrons 
from our budget, we have a total of eight electrons to spend. So when we make one bond, we have to subtract two from our total electrons, all right? When we make our second bond between carbon and hydrogen, because we're on step three, remember, um, we need to subtract another two electrons from our total electron count. So we've got four electrons left. All right, now you can see where this is going. We need to attach two more H's. It'll cost two more electrons per bond, right? So we go two, four. So let's just subtract four electrons all at once. This leaves us with zero electrons. So it took all of our remaining electrons to attach um, to attach our four other hydrogens. Now, this is very good, all right? Whenever you're doing um, Lewis structures, you always, you always spend all electrons, all right? You always spend all of your electrons. This is not a normal type of budget. All right, a normal type of budget is, well, you've got this much to spend, but if you spend less, it's good, right? Um, this is, uh, like, for example, um, I, my wife and I um, got married three years ago. Um, if she's listening, she'll know that I know how long we've been married. I calculated that accurately. Um, we got married three years ago, and we had a budget for the wedding, but spending less than our budget was good, right? Because that meant we had more for the honeymoon. Um, this is not that kind of budget. An, an electron budget is like spending on someone else's dime, right? If you're paying for your own wedding, you want to spend, you know, as little as possible so you've got more left over. Um, but let's say that... Uh, you're best friends with Drake and he's going to pay your wedding and he doesn't care how much you spend, uh, you're going to spend it all, right? As much as he'll give you. That's what you're doing with electrons. Pretend that these are Drake's electrons, not your electrons, and you want to just spend them all, right? Make it rain electrons. You want to have zero. Um, another thing I should say, though, is you can never go over. You can never spend more than what you're given, but you must spend your exact electron budget every time. And here we have, we've spent our eight electrons to make um, four carbon-hydrogen bonds, all right? So we've done steps one through four. Um, oh, sorry, we've done steps one through three. Let's talk for a minute about step number four. All right, this is something, this gets into something known as the octet rule, all right? The octet rule The octet rule goes as follows. It says that each atom must have the same um, number of electrons as its nearest noble gas. All right, you must have the same number of electrons, an atom must have the same number of electrons as its nearest noble gas. And the reason why it's, so if you look at all the noble gases, all right, um, uh, here actually, so when you look at the noble gases, helium, um, helium has two valence electrons. Every other noble gas, so from neon through 
the bottom through the original gangster neon argon krypton that's kr um xenon radon and the original gangster himself all of these have eight electrons eight valence electrons um, and so every element on the periodic table, except for hydrogen that we're dealing with, um, is going to want to have eight valence electrons. And that is why it's called the octet rule, because almost everything wants eight electrons. And when you look at the Lewis structure that we've drawn for methane right here um, you can see that hydrogen if you look at hydrogen has access to two electrons right because it has one bond and one bond equals two electrons just like helium carbon up here Carbon has four bonds. Four bonds with eight electrons. All right, so that makes it the same as neon. So both of these have satisfied the octet rule. So this is the Lewis structure for methane. All right, CH4. And that is our final answer. All right, questions. Are there any questions so far? All right, let's do, um, let's do a couple more to um, um, do the Lewis structure for ammonia. NH3. All right, now step number one, we need to total our electrons, right? So we have nitrogen. Nitrogen has five valence electrons. And we have three hydrogens. Hydrogen has one electron each. So the total number of valence electrons coming in from hydrogen um, is equal to three. This gives us a total budget of eight electrons. All right, um, now, hang on, all right, um, so that's step number one, good to go, total our, our electrons. Step number two, we need to select a um, central atom, and when you look at the Lewis dot structure for nitrogen with its five valence electrons, you can see that nitrogen has three unpaired electrons, so it likes to make three bonds under normal circumstances. Hydrogen has one unpaired electron. Because nitrogen makes more bonds than hydrogen, we're gonna select it as our central atom. All right, so we've, that's step number two, select your central atom. Step number three is attach all other atoms. Now we have one, to three hydrogens to attach. All right, so we need to make one, two, three nitrogen, hydrogen, single bonds. And we know it takes two electrons per bond. So we have spent six electrons out of our budget to attach all of our, all of our hydrogens, right? Attach our other atoms to the central. Now, Step number three is done, but you'll notice we still have two electrons up in our budget. And I said in the last example that you need to spend all your electrons, right? They're not yours, they're Drake's. You wanna spend them to have a good Lewis structure. We're gonna spend them all, all right? Now, we can't end with two electrons, but don't worry, we still have step four. 
when you look at your hydrogens, your hydrogens all have two electrons each, all right? Two electrons, because they have one bond, and that's all hydrogen wants. But right now, when you look at nitrogen, nitrogen has three bonds. Let me make myself a little more room here. Nitrogen has three bonds, which only represents six electrons. So nitrogen does not have its octet rule satisfied yet. And here's the thing. If you break the octet rule, if you violate the octet rule, your structure is wrong. You'll get zero points on an exam. There's no partial credit for violating the octet rule. All right. And here we have nitrogen with six bonds. It needs, sorry, three bonds, six electrons. It needs eight electrons to be happy. So what do we do? There's no more atoms to attach. There's no more bonds to make. We have two electrons left. And we're going to use those to satisfy nitrogen's octet. You'll notice it wants two more electrons. We have two more electrons in the budget. We are just going to give nitrogen two more electrons. So that spends our last two in the budget. And you'll notice now nitrogen has three bonds and one lone pair. All right, just to be clear, LP equals lone pair electron. Or lone pair electrons, excuse me. All right, that's what that LP equals. And one lone pair has two electrons in it. So now nitrogen has eight electrons. We've satisfied the octet rule. This is, so step four is done. This is the Lewis structure for ammonia for NH3. Cool? Okay. Let's see. Let's do another example. Let's do another example. I like this next one. Let's draw the Lewis structure for CH2O. All right, this is the molecular formula for formaldehyde. All right, step number one, we need to calculate our valence electrons. Carbon has four valence electrons. Oxygen has six. Well, I don't know why I wrote an O there. Six valence electrons. Hydrogen, as we know, has one, but we've got two of them. So we've got, um, let's see, 12. 12 electrons to spend. Now, that's step number one, total your electrons. Step number two, pick a central atom. Let's look at our Lewis structures, our Lewis dot structures. Carbon has four valence electrons. Oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six. Hydrogen has one. Now, our cent we should select for our central atom whichever element likes to make the most bonds. Hydrogen has one unpaired electron, so it likes to make one. Oxygen, you'll notice, has two unpaired electrons, so it likes to make two. But carbon has four unpaired electrons. It likes to make four bonds. We're going to select carbon as our central atom. All right, now, we're gonna throw carbon in the middle. Step number one. Step number two, sorry, no, that's step two. Step three, we need to attach our other atoms to our central atom. So we have an oxygen and two hydrogens. Attaching our atoms will cost one, two, well, we have to make one, two, three bonds, two electrons per bond. 
means that we're spending six electrons. All right, so we have six left in our budget. Step number three, we need to complete our octets, all right? So when you look at oxygen, all right, so let's, let's take a look at oxygen. At this moment in time, it has two, it needs eight. So how many electrons do we need to give oxygen? Six more, right? We need to give it six more and you'll notice that we have six electrons left in our budget. So if we, if we give oxygen three lone pairs, we spend the rest of the electrons in our budget, we have zero. And now it has um, it has eight electrons, right? One bond, three lone pairs, full octet. So oxygen has a full octet. Hydrogen has two electrons, it only needs two. We're all good. Now what about carbon? Carbon has three bonds, which means it has six electrons. Carbon's octet is not satisfied. And here's the thing. If you have an element in your Lewis structure that does not have eight electrons around it, you'll just get a zero. All right. There's no partial credit. It is never an option to leave something with less than eight electrons. It's never an option to violate the octet rule in that way. But we have another problem, right? There's, there's no electrons left in our budget. We've got no electrons left. So how do we do that? How do we satisfy carbon's need for two more electrons when there's no more electrons to give? This is a problem that you're going to run into frequently. It's going to feel like you are, and I'm going to put this in quotes, quote unquote, missing two electrons. All right. It will feel like you're missing two electrons. Whenever you're quote unquote, missing two, the solution will always be the same. All right. You're going to take two of the electrons that you use to make a lone pair. And instead of having them as a lone pair, I'm, you can see I'm Xing them out. You're going to make oxygen share them between itself and carbon. All right. So when you're two electrons short, when you have an element that needs two more electrons, Take a lone pair off of an atom right next to it, okay? And have that atom share those electrons in a second bond with that element. So the Lewis structure here, correct Lewis structure, will look like this. Oxygen will only have two lone pairs and it will have two bonds or a double bond between itself and carbon. Whenever you're missing two electrons, the solution to that problem is create a double bond. All right, you'll notice now that carbon has three bonds and one lone pair. So that's eight electrons. Oxygen has two bonds and two lone pairs. So that is also eight electrons. So both of these have a satisfied octet. 
Cool. Let's do another example. All right, let's do, let's draw the Lewis structure for O2. All right, step one, oxygen has six valence electrons. Oxygen also has six valence electrons. So we have 12 electrons in our budget. Um, Well, we have, as far as selecting... Oh, question. Does it matter how you place the hydrogen and oxygen around the central atoms? Sulai, great question. Um, it does not. Um, it does not matter. And here's the reason why. Um, so, Lewis structures... Oh, hang on. So, um, so here's the thing to remember that Lewis structures Lewis structures show us um, which atoms are connected to which atoms. So they show us connectivity, not shape. All right. So as long as you have your carbon double bonded to an oxygen, and then that carbon has two single bonds to hydrogen, it does not matter where you draw them. You could have the oxygen up top or oxygen to the side or, or whatever. As long as the correct atoms are connected in the correct way, um, your Lewis structure is, is correct, all right? But it doesn't matter which orientation you draw them in. Excellent question. All right, here, so for this example, we've calculated our total valence electrons. There, the idea of a central atom here is kind of meaningless because we only have two atoms um, in this molecule. So to connect them, it's just going to take two electrons, right? Um, which leaves us with 10 electrons in our budget. So we've attached our atoms. Now we need to satisfy our octet. And you'll notice that with the first oxygen, Right now, it has one bond. So it needs, it has one bond, which is two electrons, right? So it needs six more electrons. We're going to give it lone pairs. All right, we're spending six. There's four left over. But you'll notice our other oxygen also needs six electrons. It has one bond, which is two electrons. It needs six, but how many electrons do we have to give it? We only have four. All right, and then we're out. So we can give this oxygen two lone pairs but the problem is it only has six electrons, but it needs eight, all right? We're in that scenario that we saw with the last problem. We're missing two, all right? Again, we've hit that thing where we are, and I'm putting it in quotes, missing two electrons, all right? The solution here is always the same. When you're missing two electrons, you've got to create a double bond. All right. Remove, take two electrons away from your oxygen. That's fine. And use that to create, make that oxygen share them with the others. Use it to create a double bond. So the answer, the correct Lewis structure here we'll have two oxygens with a double bond, right? Sharing two bonds between them and they each have two lone pairs. All right, that is the Lewis structure 
for O2. All right, let's do, um, so there we just finished satisfying our octets. Let's do another one. Let's draw the Lewis structure for N2. All right, um, again, step number one, we have to calculate our total number of valence electrons. Nitrogen has five electrons. Turns out the other nitrogen also has five electrons. So we have 10 electrons in our budget. All right, again, in this scenario, we do not have a central atom per se, because we only have two atoms in this molecule. Um, connecting the two, so there's step one, step two, and step three, all in one fell swoop. We're getting good at this. Excuse me. Um, spending two of our electrons, of our 10, in our budget to connect them, will leave us with eight. All right? Now again, it's time to satisfy our octets. Nitrogen um, needs eight electrons, just like everything. So, and nitrogen at this moment in time only has one bond. So we are going to spend two, four, six electrons to satisfy one of our nitrogen's octets. The other nitrogen also needs six electrons, but we only have two electrons to spend. So we can only afford to give it one lone pair. Now, we're not going to play favorite atoms here. You know, it's like it's like if you had two kids and one's your favorite, you give one of them three lone pairs for Christmas and then the other one only gets one, right? That's not how we play things. Everybody's got to get the same um, because we love them equally. They're both two beautiful nitrogens who deserve to have full octets. Now, this seems similar to the last previous two examples. Um, you may be looking at this and going, okay, that one nitrogen doesn't have a full octet. I know what to do. Let's take a lone pair away from this nitrogen and turn it into a double bond, right? We'll make that nitrogen share to complete the other one. But I want you to notice something. As of right now, this nitrogen has two bonds, which is four electrons, and one lone pair, which is two. After doing our trick where we make a double bond, we still don't have a full octet on this nitrogen. This situation seems to be slightly different. We're not missing two electrons here. We are missing four. And the way you fix that situation is you do the same trick we've been doing twice. You're going to make a triple bond. Because we can't have more electrons than our budget and we can't have an atom with an incomplete octet. So we are going to take a second lone pair away from that first nitrogen and make a triple bond between the two. So our answer here for the Lewis structure of N2 is nitrogen, each with a lone pair, triple bonded to each other. All right, and that is our Lewis structure for nitrogen. All right, so um, let's, so at, that is, we've completed our octets. That's the Lewis structure. Um, we've got a, quite a few reps in using the first four uh, steps for drawing Lewis structures, um, but it's time to cross the threshold and start talking about um, formal charges. Now, we haven't had to up to this moment in time because all of the, um, all of the examples that I've been using have 
only involved um, structures that have no formal charges in them. But that won't be the case um, on the exam and the final. You'll have to deal with formal charges. So it's it's time to learn how to handle step five um, and eventually step six. But we're just going to do a step five. I think I'm going to hit step six on Wednesday. All right. Let's um. So let's talk about formal charge for a minute. Um, part of the reason why we haven't dealt with it, like like I said earlier, is we haven't done any examples um, that have a formal charge. Um, and the best way to introduce this is talk about um, Lewis structures. loose structures of ions or I should say not of ions but of covalent ions this sounds like a contradiction in terms you're like wait a minute we talked about the loose structures of ionic compounds electrons are shared they're taken that's what introduced this whole thing what do you mean covalent ions i thought there were ionic compounds and covalent compounds yes there are but there are the ions that we used to introduce this topic were all atomic ions but there are molecular ions there are ions with more than one atom in them for example let's look at um, uh, what would be a good ion to start with? How about yes? Okay, sorry. We'll do we'll do hydroxide. All right, hydroxide's an ion because it has a charge. That being said, it is a covalent compound because it is a compound in which oxygen is bonded to hydrogen. So let's follow our steps here. Um, first, step one, uh, we need to calculate... Mm, actually, I'm going to do this over on the side, just like I always did. First, we need to calculate the electrons in our budget. So oxygen has six valence electrons. Hydrogen has one valence electron. And now you have to take into account the charge. All right. The fact that we have a charge of negative one means that there is one extra electron. All right. And you represent, oops, that electron here. The charge of negative one means that you need to add one extra electron to your valence count when you're totaling your valence electrons for your budget. So hydroxide has an electron budget of eight electrons, six from the oxygen, one from the hydrogen, one from the negative charge. All right, we're going to select oxygen as our valence electron. All right. <laughs> I don't know what that sentence means. We're going to select oxygen as our central atom. How about that? Um, next, we need to attach hydrogen. This is going to take two electrons out of our budget. Leaving us with six. Hydrogen has a full octet, right? It has two electrons, just like helium. Oxygen has access to two electrons, but it wants six. Six more, right? It wants to have a total of eight. It has two. It needs six more. So we are going to spend, excuse me, a 
one, two, three, four, five, six, our remaining six electrons to give it a full octet. We've got no electrons in our budget. Um, oxygen's looking good, but this as is, is not the answer. And the reason is, the reason why this is not the answer is because we're dealing with a charged molecule and there are no charges included in the structure we've just drawn. All right. So for answer to be complete, we need to include in our structure, the negative charge that exists in this molecule. And to do that, we need to learn how to calculate formal charges. All right, we need to calculate formal charge so we can include that negative charge in the um, Lewis structure that we just drew. So on the next slide, I'm gonna show you how to calculate formal charge and then we'll come back to this structure and uh, do it to finish out our um, Lewis structure of hydroxide. All right, so here's how you calculate formal charge. To calculate the formal charge on an atom, so this is the formal charge of an atom. All right, it equals the number of electrons that the atom has when it's neutral. All right, minus the number of electrons um, the, atom the atom has in the structure. I should say the number of electrons of the atom. in the structure. And this difference is the formal charge. On the atom. All right, now, the number of electrons um, for the neutral atom, we get this from the periodic table. All right, and just to be clear, we're talking about valence electrons. All right. These are the number of valence electrons. Um, oh, <laughs> okay. Um, now, for the number of electrons that are in the structure, this takes a little more, a little more work. So the number of valence electrons of the atom in the structure Um, you calculate like this. So first, um, each atom gets one, and this is, again, this is only for the formal charge calculation. You get one electron 
per bond plus plus the atom gets all lone pair electrons. All right, one electron per bond plus all lone pair electrons. The reason why this is, is because, um, as you know, each bond is made when two atoms decide to share their one unpaired electron. So when you're calculating formal charges, you remember that each atom brought one electron into that bond, and so they only get one bond for the purpose of this calculation. All right, so with that in mind, let's look at the structure we drew for hydroxide and calculate the formal charge on each atom. All right, so for the formal charge for hydrogen, um, hydrogen, when it's neutral, has one valence electron. All right, in this structure, Hydrogen only has one bond and no lone pairs, so we know it gets one for every um, bond it makes. So in this structure, one minus one means that hydrogen has a formal charge of zero. So this is a zero formal charge on hydrogen. Let's do the same calculation for oxygen. Now oxygen when it's neutral has six valence electrons. In this structure oxygen has one bond and then six electrons in lone pairs, right? It's got six lone pair electrons and then one bond. So one plus six is seven. Six minus seven is negative one. So in this structure oxygen has a formal charge of negative one, and you represent that formal charge of negative one by writing a negative next to your oxygen in your structure. So the correct answer for the Lewis structure of hydroxide would look like this. The correct answer for the Lewis structure of hydroxide is you got your oxygen and your hydrogen single bonded to each other with a negative one floating next to your oxygen. Now, Something I want to say, uh, some of you may have learned to do um, formal charges like this, where you draw the Lewis structure and you put a bracket around it and then you put the charge, ionic charge, on the outside of the molecule, all right? Like on the outside of the bracket. Um, and something I have to say is for the Lewis structures, um, both of these are okay. All right, um, both of these are correct. So you can totally do that, all right? You can just draw the Lewis structure like normal and then throw a bracket around the molecule and put the charge outside the bracket. 100% okay. Um, and based on the calculation I just showed for formal charge, you may be going, well, why why would we go through that song and dance when I can just slap a bracket around my Lewis structure and put the charge outside? Um, the You can, if I asked you to draw the Lewis structure for hydroxide, do that and get full credit. But, um, but I need to issue a caveat emptor. All right, caveat emptor is Latin for buyer's beware. Um, so
So you will need to learn. You will need to calculate formal charges um, to determine the best resonance structure. which is step six. Which is step six of the, um, of the how to draw Lewis structures program. All right, so you can totally do this, but you also still need to learn how to calculate formal charges because if you don't, um, then you're going to get some of the Lewis structures incorrect when we get to resonance structures, um, et cetera. Cool, so, so, so you don't need to here, but there are examples coming in your future where if you don't know how to calculate formal charges, um, you, you won't be able to get the right answer. So even if you like the bracket method, you can use the bracket method, you still need to be comfortable calculating formal charges. Cool? Okay, I'd like to end this lecture with one last example. Um, let's calculate the Lewis structure for the molecule nitrate. All right, now step number one, um, nitrogen has five valence electrons. Um, oxygen has six, but here we've got three of them. Three times six is 18. All right, and don't forget, we have a negative charge, um, which means that we have to um, add, oops, one more electron to our budget. So we have five plus 18 plus one to give us a total budget of 24 electrons. All right. Now, when it comes to picking our central atom, the Lewis dot structure for nitrogen, nitrogen has five valence electrons. Oxygen has six. You can see that oxygen has two unpaired electrons, whereas nitrogen has three. So nitrogen likes to make more bonds. So we are gonna put nitrogen in the middle. Nitrogen in the middle, it's our central atom. Our next step is we need to attach our other atoms to our central. Three bonds will cost us six electrons, leaving us with 18. All right, now each oxygen in this structure, all right, um, I'm gonna, each oxygen in this structure has two electrons, but it wants eight, right? So it needs six more electrons. We've got three oxygen, six times three is 18. So to give all of our oxygens octets, we'll require one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 electrons, and that is all that's left. All right, we're out. Every oxygen has a full octet, but you'll notice that nitrogen does not have a full octet. All right, um, we're missing two electrons, but we're not worried, we know what to do. When we're down two electrons, we need to take a lone pair away from one oxygen and turn that into a double bond. So the Lewis structure here will have nitrogen double bonded to one oxygen, single bonded to the other two, and the other two have three lone pairs each. All right, so we've done steps one through four. We totaled our electrons, selected our central atom, attached the others, filled our octets, 
Step five, we need to calculate formal charges, all right? For this oxygen, neutral oxygen has six electrons. In this structure, oxygen has two bonds, so we get one electron per bond, so that's one, two, plus four lone pair electrons, so it has two plus four is six, zero formal charge on this oxygen. Let's check out this nitrogen. When nitrogen is neutral, it has five valence electrons. In this structure, nitrogen has four bonds. So it has a formal charge of positive one. Let's look at this oxygen. This oxygen has, well, oxygen has six electrons when it's neutral. In this structure, it has one bond, so that's one electron, plus six lone pairs. One plus six is seven. Six minus seven is negative one, so this oxygen has a formal charge of negative one. And finally, our last oxygen, six when it's neutral, one bond plus six lone pairs, so that's seven electrons in this structure. Six minus seven is negative one. So to write in our formal charges, which I'm going to do in red, our nitrogen in the middle has a formal charge of positive one. And our two of our oxygens have formal charges of negative one. And then the third oxygen has a formal charge of zero. You never write a zero in. You only write positive or negative formal charges. So this is the Lewis structure for nitrate. This is the correct answer. All right. Now, I want to end this lecture with a question. I want to end this lecture with a question. So I, okay. Just taking a look at my previous slide. Okay, so I drew the Lewis structure for nitrate like this. All right. And um, it takes a while to draw all these dots. We have two formal negatives, formal positive. Um, this is how I drew the Lewis structure for nitrate. Um, it's not the only possible correct answer. All right. Um, you could have also totally drawn the Lewis structure for nitrate like so. You could have maybe drawn the double bond between nitrogen and oxygen over here. Now we've got a bunch more lone pairs to draw in. Get our formal charges correct. So you could have also drawn it like so. There's a third option. Of course, you could have drawn the double bond between the oxygen that, that I have uh, pointing down. And this would have been another totally fine answer. Um, all of these are equally valid. All of these would get full credit um, on an exam. Uh, but nonetheless, there are four different ways, sorry, three different ways to draw this Lewis structure. Now, here's my question. There are three different oxygens in this molecule, right? And my question for you is this. Which oxygen? Oh, dyslexia makes spelling fun. Which oxygen is double bonded to nitrogen?
Ooh. Which oxygen is double bonded to nitrogen? All right. Is it... I'm going to call this oxygen A. Is oxygen A double bonded to nitrogen? Is oxygen B double bonded to nitrogen? Or is oxygen C double bonded to nitrogen? All right. Um, oh, um, actually, Brush, the answer to your question is neither. So, which, here's my question for you guys. Which one has a double bond? Is it oxygen A, oxygen B, or oxygen C? And the answer to this question you're going to have to wait till next lecture to hear this explained. So I'm going to leave you with a cliffhanger, hanger, cliffhanger, a cliffhanger here. The answer to this question of which oxygen is double bond, is it A, is it B, is it C, is this. All of them and none of them. are double bonded to nitrogen. And you will have to tune in on Wednesday to hear the thrilling reveal of how they can all be double bonded to nitrogen and none of them are double bonded to nitrogen at the same time. Cool, so we will put a pin in lecture here. Um, as always, I'm totally down to uh, hang for a little bit after lecture. If you guys have questions, stuff you want to talk about. I know some of you got to peace out and hit up other classes. But um, we'll continue this uh, thrilling discussion um, on Wednesday. Oops. So now, questions? Questions, comments? I'm here to take them all. Yeah, I would say um, today was uh, one one of the um, one of the calmer days in the comment section. Um, <laughs> um, it was it was there was a flurry at the beginning. Um, I got to dab, and then then it was a long long slog to the end. Um, I even thought I was actually wondered started wondering i was like did did my did my feed freeze up like like is it not loading new comments am i missing them but um but i i i don't know if you could tell at one moment i uh dialed it up through a different browser to load to see if you guys were leaving comments that i wasn't seeing and, and there wasn't anything there so that was a relief um <laughs> i know you weren't there raj because uh Cause, uh, cause your name wasn't popping up in the feed. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, dude, that's, that's, that's the beauty of YouTube though, right? You can like peace out, but know that you're not missing anything cause you can pop back in and see what was going down. Um, it's also, also a reason why, um, why I'm like, not just the rewatch thing, but, but another reason why I'm, I'm thinking I want to continue doing this is, um, you know, there's always, there's always the spring semester's cold season, right? And not every 
year is a global pandemic, but there's always that like couple months right in the middle where, you know, people are, are missing class cause they're sick and they can't come in. They shouldn't come in. But, um, but I, but then, then you're faced with that conundrum of like, do I go in like a zombie, but at least I'll hear what's going on or do I try to borrow notes? Well, if it's up online, you could watch it live or you could watch it later and you don't have to have that FOMO, right? That fear of missing out, um, on content or like tips like, Oh, he said this would be on the exam or whatever you, you get, you get it all. And so much more. Um, anyways, I, I just, I think that, um, I know there's been a lot of like kind of fear, um, among faculty of how this will change teaching the, the long-term repercussions of what happened this semester and all the closures and the, um, online lectures and stuff. And, and I understand it from the perspective of there, there are some people who are afraid because they, um, because technology is foreign. Um, but, but I'd say largely the fear, um, at least among like the STEM community is there's portions of our instruction that, that can't be replicated online, right? There's the, the point of the labs is not just to like, you know, have a thing that you have to show up to for six hours a week. The, the point is to actually learn physical skills setting up experiments, handling chemicals and compounds that we can do the best we can to emulate that online because we have to right now. But, um, but it's an inferior, you're getting an inferior education if you're not actually practically learning those skills. And I realize not everybody needs to be a chemist, um, but there are some skills that you just, you can't acquire any other way. And even if you're not a chemistry major, maybe you're engineering, um, um, even, even nursing students, et cetera, like need to know how to handle volumes and liquids and measurements and all that stuff. Like that's the reason why those labs are there to teach those skills. And that can't be replicated perfectly online without physically interacting with the materials. So there's a lot of fear about that getting replaced. And, and I get that, but I also think there's a huge positive thing that's happening. Like all of us are forced to try to figure out how to do this online. And, and I know for me personally, there's definitely some stuff in here that I'm coming up with that I would have never tried. I actually, you know, actually, I don't know that I would have never tried it. I definitely, I was actually playing around with the idea of doing this before COVID happened, but, um, but there was no impetus. There wasn't anything that was going to force me to try to see if I could do live streaming of my in-class lectures because my in-class lectures are pretty good. Students tend to enjoy them. Why well, mess with a good thing? Um, I didn't think anybody was really missing anything, but this whole uh, pandemic, this whole crisis kind of forced us all to figure something out because there's no other way to do it. And now that we have... I can see from this side of things like, oh, this would be very easy to implement um, in a normal semester, in a traditional classroom. Um, this wouldn't take a lot of work. It would just mean working from my computer, but doing something that I'm doing anyway, which is lecturing and writing on a board, I would just be writing on this slate and projecting it as opposed to physically writing up on the board. But um, but uh, any anyways, I don't know. I'm kind of kind of rambling. This is my post-lecture ramble. Um, but I, th I think there's actually some really good things that are going to come out of this. Um, I know for myself personally, and and um, and honestly, I, I know I said it at the beginning, but I can't stress it enough how critical your feedback to me is in how I continue to shape this course, how I continue to tweak this course um, and improve uh, my courses in the future. Um, uh, you all are awesome and your feedback was crazy helpful. Um, normally feedback is about, you, you get about as much as, as we get at the polls, um, which America's polling numbers are incredibly low. Most of us don't vote. Um, and I so appreciate you guys all voting. Oh yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we totally have. Yeah, total. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, we totally have Chem 420 office hours today on 420. How fitting uh, is that? Um, Chem 420 is my organic lab section uh, that I teach. I do office hours for that in the evening, 630. Um, so yeah, Raj, that is totally going down um, tonight. Alrighty, well, um, so I've been kind of rambling. Um, in the absence of any uh, questions or comments, I think I'm going to shut um, shut the stream down. Um, again, um, um, I just want to end by by thanking you. so much um, for your feedback. Um, I just can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Um, yeah, totally. Totally. I will... I will uh, catch you all later. Oh, Diana, um, one thing, totally forgot to say the feedback. An exam caliber worksheet, chapter by chapter. Ye okay, totally. Whoa. Um, an exam caliber worksheet, chapter by chapter. Um, th so that would be... Yes. That would be very popular. Um, I... Yeah, totally. Um, I don't know how feasible it is just given my current time constraints. Because um, generating the, the uh, exam caliber worksheet um, would essentially be uh, like writing uh, another exam chapter by chapter, um, which, which isn't as easy as it may sound. Um, you've got to check the numbers, make sure they make sense. Um, check for typos, all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, one thing, oh, you know what? Okay. Um, I have, okay. Do you want to know what the, the best... Um, this is the best, and I mean, by the best, I mean the best study advice, um, I can give, um, this is the best study advice that I can give, uh, to anyone. And it, um... It involves other humans. So, so here, step one. You, you've got to, you've got to connect with your colleagues. I realize we can't all like physically meet now, but, but there are digital ways of doing this, right? Connect with your chem peeps. Step two, you, yourself, write the hardest chem problems you can think of and think of <laughs> let's put an H in there step three you work their problems while they solve yours. Uh, 
All right. This is this is money. This is the best study advice I can give, and here's why. Um, so uh, it, it involves collaboration with, with other people. Um, but this is the best exam prep you can do because if you're so, so it, it's one, one thing to, to write a problem, to, to solve a problem, you read a problem, you solve it, but by writing a problem yourself, it forces you to interact with the material in a different way because you're the one now choosing, Oh, I want them to find this. And I'm going to give them this, this, and this to get there. All right. So it takes you inside the maze. Instead of being a rat trying to solve your way out of the maze, you're the maze maker. All right. Now, the beauty of this is you write a problem. You write a problem and you are, you are the uh, solution, right? You're the, you're the solution guide to that problem. So you give your friend the problem that you made, you know how to solve it. So if they get stuck, you can help them, but you're doing this. They did the same thing for you. They dished you out a problem that they wrote and they tried to make it hard. So you're trying to find your way through theirs. If you get stuck, you've got them as a resource. Um, but by shifting your focus from being the rat in the maze so like you're trying to get good at like solving the mazes to the maze crafter. It teaches you how these problems are built in a way that nothing else can. And once you learn that, you will have transformed yourself from you into me. And if you know how mazes are built, then when I give you my maze, which is an exam, you're going to be like, I know how to make these things. And it, you're going to get through them way faster than you would have otherwise. Um, it, is honestly how I stumbled upon this um, was as a student because um, because I I wasn't good at everything but I was good at chemistry and in study groups like it, it started actually when I was in OCHEM but then it also works ret retroactively for Gen Chem um, we would like we create like synthesis problems like oh here's a molecule how would you make this like I know how I made it how would you make it and by doing that. I, I kind of became a go-to person for that sort of thing. And by doing it, I learned how my professor's brain worked because I was forcing my brain to work in the same way. And when you do this, um, not only will you get some wicked hard problems from your classmates, because you guys, when you sit down to write your own problem, you can be as sadistic as you want. You can like try to make it as impossibly hard to solve <laughs> as you can. Um, so you're going to get some exam caliber and beyond problems out of your classmates, but also it'll change the way you think. You'll start thinking like an architect as opposed to thinking like a resident. You'll be thinking like someone who builds houses instead of thinking like someone who lives in them. And um, it's the it's the most powerful exercise for preparing for a test. Um, you... <laughs> Well, um, you can always borrow one or eat one, uh, zombie style. So anyways, that is, um, that is what I would recommend. Yes. It totally taps in to creativity and critical thinking skills because for example, oh goodness. Oh, there we go. Um, so like Diana, for example, if you sit down to write a, um, a gas law problem, right? So, so you're thinking gas laws. Well, a great place to start with gas laws is maybe the ideal gas law. P V equals N R T. All right. We always, we always know what R is. 
but you get to pick what they're going after, right? Um, <laughs> totally. So like, so like you can be like, oh, well, um, maybe I'll ask them about pressure. So what does that mean? That means that they need to find ways to get volume, moles, and temperature. And instantly, you may be thinking, okay, this, they're going to do that through stoichiometry. So I'm going to write them a chemical equation where a gas is made. Um, and they can find their moles through stoichiometry. And then um, volume, maybe a give them volume, right? Maybe we could be nice and just, like, give them this. But you don't have to be nice. You could think of another way for them to find volume. You could be mean and you could say, or make it a final volume, give them V1, um, you know, and, and make them do combined gas laws or something like that. Um, it, 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 it's only limited by your creativity and, or cruelty and, uh, and, and you'll start seeing what this will teach you is, is how I do it. Cause this is how I do it. I sit down and I'm like, okay, well, what if I want them to solve for this? Then what do I have to give them? Yeah. Good. Ra Raj, go eat some brains. It'll, it'll make you smarter. Um, so anyways, um, um, that is one resource that if you find yourself hungry for more exam caliber type questions, find your chem peeps who are down, cook some stuff up, solve it on your own, come back to each other, com compare notes. Um, it's really, really stimulating. Some of the best uh, study groups I've ever participated in uh, were study groups where everybody was doing this and we all got excited. We all got creative. Um, and then we all did really well come, come exam season. <laughs> oh man, Salvage better watch out. Raj is gonna eat your brain. Alrighty. Well, um, with that being said, um, I think I'm gonna draw um, our stream to a close. Uh, here, I'm going to um, put the timestamps up in this one, and then I'm also gonna timestamp our um, office hours from. Uh, Friday, which still hasn't been. And then uh, for anyone who's on the PDF crew still listening, I'm going to get on that situation, get those PDFs uploaded so we'll be uh, current once again. Um, dudes, I am so glad we got to hang. I mi actually missed you guys this weekend. And I woke up, actually, when I was going to bed last night, I was like, hey, in the morning I get to hang out with, with my COVID chem crew. So... Uh, thank you for making my Monday uh, brighter. I hope you all have a good 420. Maybe enjoy the playlist, and I will catch you all on Wednesday. Later. <laughs>